You are listening to the Overfunctioning Leadership Podcast, learning leadership concepts through life experience. Well, hello, friends. Welcome to another podcast sponsored by Overfunctioning Leadership. I am Alex. I'm John. And I'm Zach. And I'm Adam. Oh, we have a a new friend here. It's a new voice. Um, I believe his name is Adam Harder. I forget your middle name. Um... Me too. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I tried to zing him on that one, but he really... Okay. Um, well, anyways, we're um, going to be talking about pursuit and distance, especially like what is it and then how does it manifest within leadership. And so that's where we're going to go today. But before we do that, we should probably recap what we did last time. Um, Zach, it was about are you afraid to be a leader? And your inequivocal que- answer to that is... Uh, I am afraid all the time. <laughs> It was a question we got from a listener, which proves that we do have listeners, and we do answer their questions. So there's, like, logical truth in that. And uh-huh. so from there, we talked about uh, why people might be afraid to be leaders and what might be the cause of that. We spent some time thinking about guiding principles. As one thinks through what they really believe, it brings a sense of settled calmness and eventually allows them to gain more confidence and then desire to lead a bit better. Yeah. And, and Adam, are you afraid to be here right now? Um, a little bit. But, I feel as a teacher, I've made enough mistakes in public that I'm reasonably <laughs> comfortable at the moment. And some of those are well documented. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> many, many grievances for many, many people. But luckily my early years were pre social media craze. Oh, so. that's good. Uh huh. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do want everyone here to know that I am afraid of what's about to happen. I'm expecting to be schooled because I'm literally surrounded by teachers. Oh, yeah, that is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe we should talk about uh, Adam. Tell us who you are a little bit. That'd probably be good. Give idea. us some yeah. background. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm still Adam. And uh, I, I'm currently a teacher at Stoneman River Falls High School. Mm-hmm. I teach math, and uh, most specifically, I'm involved with the AP Calculus program. And then I also teach a Math 3 course, which is like an Algebra 2 equivalent. I um, also am the advisor for National Honor Society at the high school. And You like frogs? Oh, big fan. And Vivian. Big, big and fan. fan. Yes. Um, yeah, it's almost unsettling. Uh, so, and it's, it's not just, yeah, it's, it's nearly a problem, I would say. <laughs> can um, I ask? Can luckily I, I have a very patient wife who allows me to own a multitude of frogs. There's so many leadership questions. Yes, I have there is. A I can, so how to I'm, lead I'm, an army of frogs. Yes. yes that's, that's what a group of frogs is called, by the way, is okay. an army. army. Yeah, well, this is helpful. So uh, I, I don't know much about frogs, but I'm curious. Yeah, how long do we have? <laughs> as long as we want. So how, how many frogs do you have in your tank? Uh, well, you say tank in a singular sense, which right, <laughs> which so, is inaccurate. Um, I have a let's call it a wall of frogs. Okay, so, so in one, so how many different tanks do you have? Um, I would say somewhere around fifteen or twenty. Do okay. you call the battalions? A battalion of frogs is one tank, and then negative. No, no, no. I just so, call them groups. Okay, so you don't continue. Though the I am army reconsidering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do they ever get in formation? Um, not purposefully, but sometimes <laughs> things get a little, un, little unsettling during feeding uh, time. I would, they I would gather like to, around. I would like to say though, and reproductively, they definitely do get in formation. They, they do. Yes. Are we, are we allowed you, to biology. talk about that? Are we going to have to add a, uh, I'm the biology parental person. guidance right. recommended? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> There's still clean lyrics. We're good. <laughs> so, 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 so in one tank, mm-hmm. your biggest tank, perhaps how okay. many frogs are in that tank? Uh, about five. Okay. Yeah. So, so usually I keep them in groups of three to five, depending on the species and stuff all right. like that. So here's my question. Let's mm-hmm. say that you have a tank of five frogs. Okay. And you suddenly decided to put five more frogs in that tank. Okay. What would be the likely outcome of that? Uh, it depends very highly on the species and the size of the tank. Okay. So in the the in the one tank, I have some Ranitmea vanzellinii in there. Mm. Uh, any oh. Ranitz Maya fans in the room? Yeah, no? definitely. Are uh-huh. those red ones? Uh, those are actually black with yellow spots. Oh, and then yes. like an au- marbled aquamarine color mm-hmm. on the on the legs. Very small frog, commonly referred to as a thumbnail uh, frog, because all adults are about is that about like two centimeters. I went metric there the for you. The size of your thumbnail. Okay. Uh, indeed. 
And um, <laughs> I was hoping it was going to be something else. <laughs> really, really bad. It's actually size your pinky. Oh, I miss that size. Yeah. So, uh, but either way, there's five of those in there. And they tend to do well in groups. Um, sometimes males will fight a little bit. So it would depend on the sex ratios of the current inhabitants, as well as the ones that you were putting in and the size of the tank. So I have about five of those in a 29 gallon tank. And, um, I got them from somebody, they're already a breeding group. So there hasn't been any aggression issues or anything like that, but a group that's currently going well, I would hesitate to mix some more in, but I could probably put some more females in there without a problem and potentially one more male, but that could cause some conflict. So I'd have to keep an eye on the behavior for a couple of weeks. And what would be the root of the conflict? What are they arguing over? (laughs) Mating. Uh, yeah. So in the case of, uh, there's a little bit of male aggression in that species. So when a male is, when a dominant male is calling, he might jump on top of and kind of smash other males in that process. Or if he hears them calling, he might go over and kind of, so frogs, believe it or not, will wrestle. I see. Yeah. So is it a thoughtful, uh, action or is it more an automatic behavior. Uh, I would say everything they do is an automatic behavior. (laughs) So the (laughs) reptilian brain, Oh yeah. uh, Amphibian brain, but okay. (laughs) I'm with you. So what's the difference? I understand the analogy you're making there. Yeah. So what's the reptilian brain versus the amphibian brain? Um, time spent in water. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, because it'd be bereft of any forebrain for sure. Right. And Cerebellum? I'm not. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure I, they, I can't say I've done too much research into amphibian brain structure. Yeah. I, mean, how, and, I don't know how deep you want to go here. I'm pretty sure they have medulla, which is always great. Yeah. And then they're going to have some sort of okay. optic lobes, olfactory lobes. You know, yeah. we're really, yeah. my. I want to say my biological, yeah. you know, parts are tingling. <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> we'll say, say that. That's probably That's right. <laughs> Still clean lyrics. Anyway, so, you know, <laughs> since Adam's talking. But, you know, I always think of two things. I'm going to let John jump in here, but two things I always think of with all animals, they want to do two things and two things only, survive and reproduce. That's So if any mm-hmm. arguments, anything they get into, it's always going to be wrapped around those two things. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, how, how playful are your frogs? <laughs> on, a, on, like on a scale of zero to ten. Now, so my first answer is not at all, uh, but that's from, so from a logical viewpoint. Yeah. That not at all, but okay. from an from a personification viewpoint. So as I observe them, I might I might classify certain behaviors as playful, but it's more so that I'm enjoying mm. the way they're moving or doing sure. things, sure. but not that they're actually engaging in play. Right. If I'm not mistaken, play is primarily restricted to mammals and mm-hmm. like birds. Mm-hmm. I think birds have an aspect of play as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think of Ed Friedman talked about... Especially anything in like the parrot family. Yeah. (laughs) So Ed Friedman, who we've talked about, Ed Friedman has written several books, including Failure of Nerve. But in that book, he talks about a hallmark of an anxious system is deadly serious. Mm -hmm. And people are thinking with their reptilian or amphibian brain, and they have no sense of wonder, playfulness at all. It's just deadly serious. Um, so yeah, interesting analogy. I don't know what you guys thought, but interesting analogy between systems and frogs and, and, uh, and that. So mm-hmm. it was interesting. To yeah. Hear. Just a big step up of, you know, when we have all this anxiety, what are we going to go to? And it's just those basic, <laughs> I think we go more towards the survival. I don't think, you know, we want to survive. We don't think directly of mating, I guess, if there was, mm-hmm. if we're on a deserted yeah. Island, maybe sure. that's your yeah. next step. Well, but I, I think a lot of that survival is, is rooted in exerting your dominance over even the other members of your own species or group. So, so I think that's why they go to that wrestling. Like in, you know, a lot of people don't consider frogs to be a very dangerous animal per se, because they don't have any weaponry, so to speak. But, um, you know, just through their acts of wrestling with each other, boxing each other out of food. So they'll like, when you dump food in, Mm -hmm. they'll like tackle one and keep it away while they eat and things like that. Mm. So it's just that idea of being in control of that situation from start to finish. So there's definitely a hierarchical structure then where there's at least a top dog or frog. And then, yes, but outside of that top frog, have you been saving that one? I've I've been waiting. (laughs) It's the only thing I prepared for this entire talk. (laughs) If you can somehow mix in ribbit somehow, like, oh, that was a ribbiting conversation or something. Uh, Oh, or the world wide web. Yeah. Oh yeah. I looked that up on the world wide web. 
the www right webs I'm, right. I'm confused well oh, frog man. frog legs are webbed oh. feet <laughs> <laughs> are those well, that one went right over my head yeah they actually are clawless although i believe um african clawed frogs yeah so they do, do have, have yeah. i was gonna say there's one only on the back legs though it's for holding onto rocks so they don't get washed away in the yeah, current they're, they're um underwater frogs mm-hmm. anyways wow. and arguably one of the big well, I don't want to get it. Okay. Invasive species. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Yeah. So, Hugely um, invasive and carries citrate and, okay, kitchen <laughs> fungus. So we will, you know, you know I think part of this turn this into a zoology too, podcast. Oh, yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> we could go into the calculus of leadership, but I think we should probably go into a fable first, and then we, we'll dance around and play a little bit here. Um, so if you go ahead and everybody could just go ahead and get out their celery stalks, get some peanut butter out, put it in, put it in the middle of the celery stalk. Put some raisins down and get some ants on a log, especially with our biology discussion. We're going to toss this over. It's going to be a bit of a forced fable to Adam, so have fun. Go. Uh, hooray. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So uh, my fable, when I, I initially started thinking about this topic and thinking about this idea of pursuit or distance, um, one of the things that I related it to was jujitsu. And um, when, you're, uh, when you're engaged with someone in jujitsu, um, when, when you're rolling with that person and practicing your moves, um, you have a particular agenda, uh, in what you want to accomplish and how you want, um, how you want those movements to go. And they also do. And part of your agenda is maintaining a particular distance. So people like to work from different distance levels. So some people might to work, might like to work very close or from a particular position, or some people might to, uh, you know, you always want to maintain contact with that other person, but um, you might work from different positions that provide different degrees of closeness and different pressure that you put on that person. And a lot of that depends on your body structure and things like that. Yeah. But when I was thinking about pursuit and distance and, um, and the maintaining of that in a system that's going back and forth, that was one of the first things that came to mind hmm. was this idea of each person having a particular thought in what the appropriate level of distance is based on what they want to happen at that particular moment in that engagement. Yeah. And so could that be related then to individuals just as a whole? So maybe we need to go into what is pursuit and distance when we talk about like leadership. So what is pursuit and distance? What is this dance that we're talking of? Well, Bowen theory talks about the law of reciprocity and when one pursues the other distances. I I was speaking with someone who is uh, currently in the online dating world and she was telling me, you want to talk about pursuit and distance. This is true in the online dating world where someone doesn't text and then someone distances and then someone pursues the text and then I don't want to respond too quickly. And it's this, it's this dance that people just pick up on. And it's hard to quantify what goes into causing it. But I think it's something all of us can observe in families and among friends is a real phenomenon. And Bowen Theory said, this is the way systems operate. Yeah, so I, 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 all, uh, throughout all of this discussion, we're really just talking about when it comes to pursuit and distance, especially relationships with people. And so I, I, does this manifest somewhere when it comes to generational? I mean, where does this start? Where do you learn some of this pursuit and distancing? Is this, does it start like from a young age? I mean, we were talking about frogs earlier and it's sort of like a, uh, where, where do frogs learn it from? It's, it's something that's just like a generalizable part of our human behavior, our frog behavior, our amphibian brain, right? Uh, you're, you're either seeking to fight or flight. You're seeking that closeness or you're seeking that distance. And I was thinking about with the jujitsu example, like that's just one example of fighting. Like when you're in a jujitsu gym rolling, right, you're expecting some sort of distance that's really, really close. And so me never having participated in jujitsu and not knowing much about it, I just think like they're all close. Like that's just who they are. But you look at boxers and boxers are probably a lot more distant because there's no grappling and all this different. And so it's... Uh, I, I think what you were leading into is it's from your family. You you look at how your parents respond. You look at how the people who raised you responded, and you respond in a similar way. I also wonder what the part of your immediate system is too. Do you behave differently 
uh, based off of the current system you're in. So let's say I'm in my small office and I see that the boss likes to handle conflict by not confronting it at all rather than Mm -hmm. directly approaching it. Do I mimic that behavior or do I not? Mm. As compared to maybe in my home, my parents were shouting and fighting and yelling. Yeah. You brought something up, Zach. It was really interesting. And then I want to go back to a question with Adam had about jujitsu. But you talked about in jujitsu. That's a hard word to say. Lots of J's. Yeah, yeah. lots of J's. Two. Um, <laughs> two. Two's hard. <laughs> lots of them. <laughs> and boxing, which is one X. And, and families. So families are not. Boxing rings are not jujitsu. Good enunciation. Thank you. So Bowen theory speaks of that there are things in systems that are always true, that there's always a tension between individuality and togetherness, which is at the heart of pursuit and distance, that reciprocity is part of a system. Yet the type of system that it is matters. Mm-hmm. You know, Um, Ed Friedman would talk about schools are not churches, are not sports teams, are not businesses. They have different characteristics. There's different expectations of closeness versus distance. It's a different homeostasis. That's right. There's a difference. But there is still a homeostasis Mm -hmm. in that particular respective system. Mm -hmm. So in my business, if I have a boss that doesn't like to approach conflict, I'm less likely to approach conflict in a direct way because it's going to change the homeostasis. Whereas people are used to looking over conflict and Mm. stepping on others' toes. So if I were to do that, it'd be an even bigger fuss than it might be normally. Yeah, you're disrupting the norms. And I would say, I would be safe to say that this gentleman, if he was was your boss, my guess is that's probably pretty true at home as well. And And I think that's where the challenge comes in is if you want to change that homeostasis if you want to change that environment how do you do so in a healthy way that doesn't cause mm-hmm. a violent disruption and cause people to be uncomfortable but how do you begin to mold that into what at least you would consider to be a more healthy situation yeah and to tack on to that i was just wondering if you're in a leadership position i know normally you're not coming into a system that you're forming around you and you're the trail runner normally I mean, people are bringing in all these different things from their families and the other systems they're a part of. But let's say you're in complete control of the system. What do you set up as the norm? Is there an ideal? Well, I think that's where the leader decides what they really believe about this particular organization and the direction they want it to to take it. So I can think of in a family, a, a parent, a mom and dad, or ideally maybe both together in a joint decision decides that in our family, this is what our family is about. This is the direction we want to take our family. And sometimes the children aren't going to want to follow that direction. But I think pushing through that uncomfortableness, I think this is really especially true in organizations that try to elicit some type of systemic change that you just kind of push through the, the naysayers and, and the people who are, resistant to change because at some level the resistance to change is not necessarily about the content of the complaint although there's something to be said for paying attention to that content but it's more about the systemic disruption of homeostasis where the system wants to go back to the way things used to be even if it's unhealthy Mm -hmm. so I, i think it might be good to talk about before we answer the question of how as a leader, how do you become better at like you know this pursuit and distance? How do you do, deal well with that? How do you change things at home? How do you become more self differentiated in that way, especially when it comes to pursuit and distance? Perhaps it would be good to start seeing some of the signs of like pursuit and distance. You know, what is what does distancing look like? So, what does that feel like? What does it look like? What, what are the different manifestations of it? So, thoughts on that, gentlemen? I. That's a great example. Uh, we've all heard of uh, Alex's dog, Misha. And <laughs> Misha was just going after a tennis ball I have in one of the side pockets of my backpack. And she's a, a beautiful little mutt. And, uh, you know, keeping this a clean podcast. Watch your words here. Yeah. And so uh, I, I'm shouting at her. And the first thing she does 
is she puts her ears down and she runs away from me, right? And then I turn around and the next thing she does is she runs back to the ball. So I yell at her again. And so she runs away from me. We do this one more time. And this third time she runs closer to me, which I thought was interesting. There was like that. (laughs) That give and go to a point where she knew I was mad enough at her to do this three times. And so now <laughs> she's seeking some sort of reparation in our relationship. She's like pursuing you. That way she could get what she wants. Because she knows the ball is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple words that come out of distance that I was looking at. And I don't know how effectual they are here. So cut off. How does cut off play? Is that like the ultimate of distancing? Where it's like, okay, we've distanced so far that we're just going to go ahead and cut off from one another. So in Bowen's theory, we have fusion and we have cut off. Those are, we love talking about spectrums. I love spectrums. And so reciprocity. Reciprocity. On one end, you got the cut off, and on one end, you got the fusion. And those are the extremes of the extremes. Am I right in that, John? Mm-hmm. And so when we're looking at that, cut off is a severing of a relationship for any period of time. And then the fusion is just the the mashing together of individuals so that you are, I don't know, are you, you're trying to make them feel and maybe mostly feel, feel, act, respond in a way that matches your own. Yeah. I think that, that distance can also look like a triangle where, uh, two people focus on Mm. a third object so they don't really have to pay attention to, the distance between the two of them. So this is not the only example, but an example that's frequent enough that I think bears worth mentioning is you have two parents and marriage is is difficult. Um, And inherently built into that difficulty of marriage is this tension between individuality and togetherness. And so one of the ways to placate or to reduce that tension is to focus on a third, uh, maybe a child or maybe even buying a dog or something like that. There's an outside focus. So I think one of the ways that you can see distance that's not apparent at first glance, you know, running away, that's obvious sign of distance. But I think this focus on a third object where that's talked about a lot can be also a subtle form of distance, but a really important one to pay attention to. And an even more toxic version of that that, um, again, is more apparent uh, when you first look at it, you might think that nothing's wrong if you're, uh, if you're, you're just focusing on your kid. Like that's what being a parent is. Not that I know, but you know, you, you're invested in your kid. And so maybe that masks it. But when it gets to the point where say the kid is a go between and the only go between of communication between you and your spouse, that seems like it'd be an especially toxic, um, extension of that sort of triangling. Yeah. I I listened to a uh, read an article today where a gentleman was encouraging parents, and this is parents that are have kids in their 20s, to, he called it, retire from parenting. And he, and he <laughs> mentioned it. And he's, he said that what that does is it focuses, it causes you to take your focus off another, where your focus becomes almost maladaptive. They, they have grown, and they're their own person, and if we continue to, to mother and father them or you know, stay immersed in their lives, it, it causes us to avoid what drove us there in the first place, which is this, um, it, refusal to, or this temptation not to focus on self and what you really believe as a person. And then also the, the, in, in this case, the marriage and how that can really restore this, this focus on the two people who've distanced from one another and focus on the kids, retire from parenting and shift it back as was his point. So then what about a fusion? Can well, you give me a... Uh, well, before we get okay, there, yeah. I, I just want to go over some, a couple more physical manifestations of this distancing. So we do have physical distance, like where somebody's getting further away from you uh, physically. But then in even a conversational end of it, as I was reading that, you know, conversation could still be taking place between people, but they're just empty, hollow conversations. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're not really talking about much of anything. The, the conversations are getting less and less relevant and to a point to where then there's going to be no more conversation. And so that's another way to, that you're going to see some sort of distancing as well. So mm-hmm. I want to make sure we went over a couple of those different yeah. things because it looks a lot different for a lot of different things. But those are some easy things that you can look at. Um, yeah, we're connecting, but we're not really saying anything to one another. That geographic distance, I think, is something to pay attention to. 
you know, for our listeners, think about the siblings, especially if you have grown adults that are siblings of yours, you know, where do they live? You know, and I've seen examples where someone lives in Seattle, somebody lives in Denver, somebody lives in Atlanta, and somebody lives in Maine. Now, that could all be, Mm -hmm. you know, reasons for it, for for vocational reasons. But the other question you ask is, what's going on with those distance? Mm -hmm. And and it may be nothing, but it may be something. So geographic distance where people live as grown children, I think, is something to pay attention to. Hmm. So uh, looking at that... Uh, that's that's the cutoff half of the spectrum. Uh, Adam, could you give me an example of frogs fusing <laughs> in an excessive manner? Um, Whatever you think that might be, if you're wow, or we can go yeah. off the, or we can go off the amphibian end as well. You could, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, frogs are great. Um, man, I I don't know if I can relate no? the fusion to the frogs at all. No, <laughs> no. I mean, no. Yeah, toenail uh, frogs smashing on one another. Hmm. Do you ever see two against one? No. No. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I did, if you don't mind me jumping off of the frog topic. Oh, yes. Um, oh, ho, ho. I, I did have a question about cutoff. So uh, you mentioned cutoff as the opposite end of a spectrum as um, fusion. Um, it, and my first thought was that cutoff seems to be uh, a reactionary and a purposeful and an intentional thing. Um, but it, overthinking a, a little bit more about it over the past couple of minutes, um, I'm thinking that maybe there's just multiple definitions of how cutoff shows up. Mm. So, cause sometimes, you know, my, when I first thought of cutoff, I thought of someone saying, okay, this is uncomfortable for me. Um, I'm closing the door on this relationship. But then I thought of other examples of cutoff where you just kind of suddenly realize I haven't seen this person in 14 years, Mm. what happened. So it was an unintentional cutoff that, um, you know, for whatever reason transpired and, you know, you might have whatever justifications for it that, that feel really good to you at the time that, Oh, I was busy with this or I was doing this, but in some way, you let a relationship slip Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a conscious decision, but rather just a product of other decisions you were making. So how does that fit into this spectrum of, of cutoff? And is if cutoff is the end of a spectrum and as a calculus teacher, I'm going to bring continuity into it. Mm. Is that spectrum continuous? So is there, you know, is cutoff, is there a smooth transition to cut off or is there a jump to cut off? Mm. So there's, there's a, a toxicity in a relationship and then there's a jump to cut off rather than this smooth transition. And uh, so that, that's kind of the thoughts I was having over the, the past minute here. Oh, wow. Uh, well, geez, I, I would, I would like to think that could be both, you know, there could be a smooth, like we're not talking to it as much and we're kind of not seeing each other as much to a point of, this has got to be cut off right now. I, I almost wonder, and I question whether or not a abrupt cutoff would be more of an acute anxiety than a chronic anxiety. Yeah, where it's, where it's reactionary. It's to, like right now. To something that's transpiring. Right now. Not like this isn't like sitting around, or maybe it has been sitting around, but like it is like, boom, the cutoff has to happen right now. Um, and I was actually reading something um, from how to be an adult in relationships um, by, I think it's Rico R A R R I C H O anyways. And he was saying in there that all relationships end, which I found really interesting. He said, just overall, you know, everybody's going to die. So, you know, <laughs> like literally they're all going to end. So how are you, what's the reaction behind it or the response that you're going to have to the, the ending of those relationships? Because I would love to say that, you know, we're all going to be buds until the end. And, you know, but like relationships do end, they do end. And so what does that look like? And um, does that change the ideas of this pursuit and distance? And my mind jumped directly to what um, Gilbert has to say, Roberta Gilbert has to say about three things when it comes to a relationship. You have to be open, you have to be uh, equal, and you have to be separate. And so I wonder about that separate piece when you're in a relationship. And if you know that your relationship's eventually going to end, it, and that could just be through death, let's just say, then if you are separate enough, does it make it easier, you know, 
when that relationship eventually is severed. Um, I think some people try to purposely create that distance in order to kind of, in a premeditated fashion, be able to cope with the ending of that relationship. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to to Adam's um, question about acute separation. I think of like over an event, there was a, like say for example, there was a, um, an argument over inheritance, you know, in a family and words were said and people said, I'm done with you. And boom, that was the end of it. Um, the other one, it, you mentioned that people just drift apart, whether it's friends or family members, and there's no one particular event that you can pinpoint. We, in my leadership class with students, we were actually read an article that was in the New York Times about people who no longer speak to family members mm-hmm. and reasons behind it. And in this article, it said that occasionally, at least the people that they interviewed, there was a particular conversation that took place that led to this abrupt cutoff. But they said more than, more times than not, it was just a gradual, you know, I haven't talked to him for three weeks. And then that turned into conversation. And then it turned into five weeks. And then a conversation. And then it turned into eight weeks. And, and then just gradually got longer and longer and longer. Um, and I think that you pose a, a question, which is, is that a problem? Or, and I, and I wrote a note here, maybe this is, you know, sometimes people drift apart. I hear people say that. Mm-hmm. And so you, you caused me to think but with that. So I'm reflecting back to my college days to a friend that I had who was, I enjoyed his company, but he was pretty annoying. And, <laughs> um, and so I found myself distancing from him. And so in my twenties and thirties, he would reach out to me and, when I, I would talk to him, I would just get annoyed all over again. And so I kept distancing more and more and more. And what I found was this, that the relationship was uncomfortable enough that I chose not to speak to him as mm. much as I used to. But if I'm going to grow myself up, I mean, Jenny Brown in her book, Growing Yourself Up, says, go back into those relationships that are kind of irritating and be a little different. And so I could say that me and Freddie, which is not his name, have kind of grown apart. But I think there's something to be said for he, he was irritating enough to me that I just grew, I distanced myself from him. And I'm not sure that was the most mature response on my part. Hmm. And huh. that got me thinking that way. Yeah, I think that there's also an element, um, we, we had mentioned earlier this idea of reciprocity that, um, and a lot of times a pursuit and distance relationship has a certain degree of, um, like acceptance within like that. This is how this relationship works. You pursue mm. and I maintain the distance. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes mm. if that pursuit isn't acknowledged and appreciated in some context, somebody might just decide to stop pursuing. And then rather than a pursuit and a distance relationship that maybe at times transfers back and forth where you pursue, I distance, you pursue, I distance. Instead, it turns into a distance, distance relationship. And then that might be what causes this, you know, this drift apart is just that both people on some level have agreed that they're going to go with the distance strategy. And because neither person pursues, that's what causes that, that what we can what people would refer to as a natural drift apart. When I love systems theory because of the lens and like, maybe this is a little bit oversimplification and it doesn't account for everything. But when you look at systems, you have like, there's a reason that systems in place. And I love to talk to my friends who are graduating high school um, because I'm very active in my church's high school ministry or people who graduated with me in college and seeing how they're doing socially Because I love to have a conversation with people about whether or not they feel as if school prepared them to continue maintaining social relationships. And I wonder if when you drill down, we talk about triangles being the smallest stable unit of the system between three points. And it doesn't have to be three people. It can be two people and something between them. Mm -hmm. Um, If that thing is high school – that, that third point of the triangle is high school. I can see why that dissolves because there's no other center for that. If that's how you define your relationship with that person, oh, I'm friends with Alex because uh, we went to the same church once. We don't go to the same church anymore. Boom, that, that mm-hmm. system's gone, and my basis for that triangle has dissolved. Mm-hmm. And then another point that um, sort of 
plays into the triangle thing is if you have one person who's always maintaining distance and the other person who's always pursuing, whatever that cause of pursuit is, whether that's a relationship or whether that's like, um, you're going to buy me dinner if I can catch you in a race or I don't know, something (laughs) real weird. Classic example. Yeah. Oh man. I do that all the time. That was right where I went. Yeah. Side note, I, uh, I have a, my roommate in uh, college, my sophomore year, still owes me. It's called a, uh, I don't know if I can say it, so I won't, but it's a mix something. <laughs> and this mix something is two um, McDoubles and a McChicken in between it. And I won something. I caught him or whatnot. And he, would, he said that next time he went to McDonald's with me, he would purchase it for me. And so he just never went to McDonald's with me. Now he maintains me. distance. And so now he maintains <laughs> distance, and that relationship has fallen apart. Yeah, the third yeah. triangle. That was that was the point of the exactly. triangle. Exactly. The mix something. <laughs> but I was flipping. I have this vivid memory of flipping through channels, and this was an introduction to this concept of Bowen's theory before realizing it. I was on that like weird Christian channel where there's some some uh, black man in front of the congregation just shouting at you, and it was startling because you're not expecting someone to shout at you while you're flipping through channels. And he's like. He said something along the lines of, you can't always be giving. If you're the only person giving in a relationship, then that relationship can't last. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting, it sounded like an extreme at the time. And I was like, hmm, how does that work? And like, you're, you're a pastor. So shouldn't like, is God constantly pursuing? Or I know that it's a whole nother layer, but I thought that was interesting because they're basically saying at some point that reason for pursuit is going to fall out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have friends who... Um, you know, like, uh, one of, one of my other hobbies is board gaming. I, mm. I have pretty much all of the hobbies, but, um, uh, if, so I, you know, I regularly send out like, you know, email invites to him and, you know, he might not respond several times and then it might get a couple negative responses, but every once in a while. So, so I'm in a state of pursuit in that, in that, like, I'm inviting you, I'm inviting you. And he's in a state of distance, uh, maybe not intentionally. He's just like busy now, can't do it now. But every once in a while he, he, um, reaffirms that, that that pursuit is appreciated. Mm. So he'll say something to the effect of, I know I haven't been able to like come out to a game night in a while, but I appreciate that you invite me, please keep inviting me. So letting me know, like he wants that, he, he wants that, um, dynamic to continue and to not just give up on the pursuit because he hasn't been able to Mm. like hang out in person or anything for a while. So I think that that can be an, an important thing is this, this affirmation of yeah. the pursuit um, and an acknowledgement that, that, you know, e- even though the relationship might feel unstable, that it's circumstantial at the time and that you want things to continue the way they're continuing. I think that can be an important element as well. Yeah. And I know earlier we were talking about the intensity of stuff too. How intense do you, is uh, this cutoff? Is it gradual or not? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that, One, we're creatures of habit, so if we're used to being friends with someone, we're going to continue. Like, the more experiences you have, the more likely you are to repeat that experience. But we also have this concept of self-differentiation, which says, how much of an individual are you? And it relates to this emotional maturity component that says, how much um, anxiety are you able to tolerate? Hmm. And typically, the more you're able to tolerate, the more differentiated you are the less extremes you jump to or less mm-hmm. – less you either jump to less extremes, you jump to them less quickly, or um, you gradually get to them slower. So what do you guys – I think – I don't want to like cut off this conversation. hey um, But oh. I, I was thinking the overall question is like what are we supposed to do as leaders – when it comes to this pursuit and distance. So let's make sure that we're answering that right now in a full wrap up. So what are your thoughts? Like what, what are some practical things, um, in this, in a non-advice way, right. (laughs) Um, of like, what, how do you do this? Like, how do you, how do you make this happen? Everybody wants. (laughs) Well, I, I think, you know, pursuing someone, or am I pursuing them for my own gain or am I pursuing them to try to influence them? Uh, I, I think as one becomes more differentiated um, in Bowen theory speak, becomes calmer, more thoughtful, more principled, more peaceful, 
that naturally others will move toward that person. They will bridge that gap versus me going and pursuing them. And so I, I wouldn't say necessarily a differentiated person pursues less. I think they pursue more thoughtfully and not for their own emotional needs. Hmm. I'm not sure I answered your question very well. No, but I just yeah, think no, no, no those are some bit. things, yeah, for sure. We talk about curiosity a lot as a part of differentiation. I think that plays a big part. I'm thinking, I'm imagining this in a business context. You have a boss, you have some managers, you have some employees, and there's some sort of interplay between all of those different levels. You got the one ups, the one downs, the two ups, the two downs, all this. And there needs to be in some level of curiosity, the the guy on the top has to care on some level about the people way on the bottom, even if he doesn't have that direct interaction with them. There has to be an appropriate level of curiosity as to um, what they're doing, how well they're doing it. Maybe not on a personal level for those two levels down, but in that same way, you want the people looking up to the boss and saying, well, how is this company doing? Are we doing well? How, what is your vision for the company? What are your mm. goals? You want them to be curious in that way, which adds that natural yeah, natural um, pursuit, that natural closeness, while at the same time, you're probably not going to have that buddy-buddy relationship with everyone in the company, which sort of leads to you defining some sort of appropriate bounds for the relationship on an individual basis. Mm. What do you think, Adam? Um, so one of the things that, that I've been thinking about over the past couple of minutes here is, um, you know, I, I was going back to this idea of homeostasis and there, that there's an established norm. And any time that, that you're going to make a change to that, it's going to cause some inherent uncomfortability as the system kind of rebalances itself. And for myself, I know that it's helped when I express my end goal to the people involved. Mm. So if I say, okay, this, this is what I want to happen. And what do you think are some things we can do? Like, do you share this goal? And what do you think are some things we can do to, to get closer to that? Mm. And rather than try to, um, you know, handle it on my own, so to speak, uh, how do I get, the other people involved in that system involved in this process and believing in the end goal mm. of either more closeness or something like that. Like you gave the example of, you know, if you have a boss that chooses to ignore problems. So how do you get everyone on board saying, okay, like, I don't think it's healthy to ignore these problems. I think it'd be great if we could talk about them in a constructive way. So how do we build a format for, for doing that in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. So that those are the kind of things that I'm thinking of is kind of stating the end goal, um, in, in that and how you want the relationship to change. And if the other people are on board for that same end goal, then you can work toward it together. Yeah. It's like you get that, that buy-in then. So they're mm -hmm. a part of the process instead of just one person, maybe over functioning. Yeah. Uh, the, the first thing that popped into my head is the subjective versus objective process by uh, by which you're trying to attain this goal is it something that's based off of feelings do you only talk about problems when there are problems and when people are distressed and emotional or do you have an objective to say we want this to be a place without conflict that regularly measures for conflict um mm. One tangential example that I'm thinking of is I just read an article talking about the fall of um, employee comparisons, employee reviews um, that were subjectively based on their performance in relationship to their peers. So I think it was IBM, maybe not. They had this thing where they cut the top 10%, the lowest 10% of their employees every so often as a way to keep supposedly fresh blood, um, skilled employees, but at the same time that so rapidly um, increased the anxiety of the system because it was such a subjective measurement that uh, when they came to actually measure this process, when they said, how do you guys feel? What do you like about the job? What do you don't? It was resoundingly, we all hate these employee reviews. <laughs> and they cut them. And they found that the result was an overwhelmingly more positive, overwhelmingly less anxious system. Hmm. Well, if, if I was going to give any, I guess, advice, as we're going to say, to 
um, this pursuit and distance, this dance that's ever going with all of our relationships of whether it's at the, where we work or at home. Um, and as a leader, I, I think I read through an example that I believe Ed Friedman gave in a failure of nerve. Um, I think so. Regardless, it doesn't matter. Um, he talked about how you have like, um, I always think of like Christmas lights or different lights. You have a series of lights. So that means that they're all connected on one string. And then if you lose one light bulb, the whole thing goes out or you can have parallel lines of lights. And so each light is on its own circuit in a way. And so if you lose one of those, then everybody, every, all the other lights still work. And so it's this idea of this self-differentiated individuality that, that I can say to Zach, like I'm connected to you, but I'm not necessarily dependent upon you. And so now we can be free to figure that out in our pursuit and distance because the anxiety is going to be there and that's going to be messing everything up. But, you know, overall, and I really appreciate what Adam had to say about like, these are our end goals. If we know the end goals, it makes it a lot easier what we're trying to do here. And that's a little bit different when you're talking about relationships with friends, especially from a younger age, even now, like, you know, when I, when I talk to Adam, we're friends, like we didn't like, well, here's where our relationship's yeah. going to be like, but at, at the same time, we have three more years we, left yeah, in our we, friendship. We, That's come our in, <laughs> <laughs> we come in with our own ideas of what a friendship looks like. And so that's, that's gotta be a part of that pursuit of distance too. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I had, I did friends differently when I was younger and this is the way I do friends now. And so, you know, that's got it. That's going to be a large part of how I do all my relationships. So, um, I was a big pursuer in a lot of my relationships growing up. So I pursue a lot of different um, relationships. I'm also very extroverted. So that helps. But so if we were to take uh, a little poll or if we were to present questions to people to help them measure sort of where they stand with regards to this, what would, what would we ask them? Like maybe one such question is who are you so tied to? that you act in a similar manner to them when you're, when the system's anxious or. Yeah. I think of a question that I ask uh, people sometimes is when they have tension with another person, do you sense that that person's open to you or closed? Mm. Just asking that question, what's their best sense? And I think that can go a long way to determine maybe they're doing too much pursuing and the person's distancing and maybe it's just too close and they need to back off a bit and work on self. Yeah. Are you thinking more than the other person mm-hmm. is the other one? Like, yep. yeah. It, it, do you think this person's thinking as, as much as you, you know, you yep. are about this exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and a funny thing about that is that Ed Freeman also says that, you know, um, the person who is distancing becomes more attractive because, um, you know, they're the distancing person is actually not thinking about the pursuer. And so the pursuer would be more attracted to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the reciprocals too, too. So the distancer is like, stop thinking about me. So mm-hmm. it's this, it's a dance, a little bit of salsa, a little salsa dancing. Hmm. <laughs> Although that's a really close dance. Maybe not. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. My What's dancing. a far dance? <laughs> Me crumping in a corner and you crumping in another corner. <laughs> Middle school dances where your arms are straight out. No touching. Yeah. No touching. Yeah, a little Holy Spirit right in between. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's going to wrap us up unless we have some final thoughts. Adam, any final thoughts about calculus and how that connects to leadership? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, did you I, mean, proof Joe, I did link in continuity. I yeah, think I think that's about, pretty. I think that's all I have there. Yeah, he did drop the word proof over there. That was nice. Yeah, I, I think I think the only other thought um, that that I had kind of lingering was um, it was going back to this uh, when two people are both in a state of distancing and and you're creating that natural distance. I think one of the things that allows that to continue so easily is that um, is, is that changing your closeness with somebody is inherently uncomfortable. So not only, so, so the distancing becomes easier and easier because it's more comfortable to let things be and let the, let the distance continue to grow than it is to actively engage and say, I'm going to change this distance and, mm. and disrupt the, the homeostasis, even though I'm not happy with the system. Um, it, there's this added uncomfortability of changing the system. Yeah. So that I just wanted to link those couple ideas together. So get ready to be uncomfortable. Everybody yeah. loves uh, loves some good awkwardness going on. I have uh, two friends that are perfect examples of that. One of them is just not uh, an extrovert in any capacity, and 
I don't know how she measures friendship, but one of her close friends is very distant from her because she can't deal with that desire for distance because any form of contact feels uncomfortable. So they're very close friends that very rarely spend time together. (laughs) Very close quotations. (laughs) Closest thing to a hermit I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like a hermit's best friend. What does that look like? It's shell. No, I don't know. The mountaintop. Yeah. I'll, I'll end. I think this is a good way to end the podcast. Um, when it comes to, we said frogs aren't very playful, but when it comes to frogs, what is their favorite outdoor game? <laughs> Eating. Croquet. Ah. Uh. Oh, oh, oh. So, I've been thinking of that for 10 minutes now, <laughs> just waiting to use that. So impressed you held that in. <laughs> oh, well, awesome. Well, you know, as we wrap this thing up, uh, you could check us out on Facebook. Um, you can get us on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. We, we got a lot going on Simplecast. in the works. We're uh, hoping to drop a website for you well, soon. Well, actually, I believe that our website will be up by the time we're, this podcast We're hoping. Is up, if, so. if anything, if, if you can click a link below in the show notes to our website, that means it is up. Do you have any idea what the website's going to be called? Uh, uh, we don't at this time. <laughs> OFL actually refers to a fishing league, which <laughs> is just a huge shame. Uh, that that would be perfect. So we're we're still looking around. We might end up with a dot biz or a dot net or oh, a dot course. dot CC. Uh, cc. What are some other good ones? <laughs> I don't know. Dot me. Anyways, you can all always email us at the of podcast at gmail dot com. That's the of podcast at gmail dot com. That's for you know John over here likes to do ov um, mm-hmm. for some reason. So um, other than that, uh, shout out to. Uh, Jetler or Jesse Huffstetler as he's known for uh-huh. uh, the theme song. We love him for that. And I think Adam, a round of applause. Don't actually yes. clap. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. Verbal I appreciate clap. it. Yeah. I'll wonderful. add a uh, sound effect after post production. <laughs> Excellent. I, yeah. I hear the applause in my head. Yeah, it's going on. <laughs> it's respectfully loud, but not too loud. Yeah. Hope you can come back. Appropriately distant. A couple, yeah. a couple yeah. whoops in there and yeah. a little. Um, a swoop. A swoop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Give me a guys. swoop and I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my first thought was we hoped you can come back, but let's let's see how our downloads are with this yeah. episode. Yeah. And, and we might we'll go from there. We might have to distance ourselves. <laughs> Your right. presence is already messed with the homeostasis. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Priscilla, she's over in the other room. Really. Now we might be interested in your frogs though. Okay. Yeah. There. Just bring a cage. <laughs> and I'm just sitting here. Now let's go to the frogs. They're just in there chirping. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, that'd be great. And they're in a good state if they're chirping, though. Indeed. Ready for yeah. mating. So. Anyway. <laughs> okay, well, uh, w- with that, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap this up. I'm Alex. I'm John. I'm Zach. And I'm Adam. And we'll catch you next time. See you on the flippity floss. See you around. <laughs>